This is a conversation with Dr. Scott McWilliams of the University of Rhode Island, brought to you by the URI Graduate School of Oceanography Coastal Resources Center in Rhode Island Sea Grant. So to start off, can you give us an idea of how birds and bats have been affected by the Block Island Wind Farm? To date, um, the work that I've read suggests that they're that birds at worst have uh, avoided being in those areas. Um, I know of no reports of direct deaths um, associated with running into these things. Um, that's consistent with what they found over in Europe as well, from about 20 years of additional research prior to what we've done in U.S. waters. So the biggest negative effect would be potentially displacement of birds from areas where they would like to be. And what steps has Rhode Island taken to minimize these impacts of the Block Island Wind Farm on birds and bats? The whole special area management plan process that they went through to cite these things. When the U.S., Rhode Island included, was thinking about having offshore wind development, Western Europe had been doing this for about 20 years. And so we enlisted the help of some of our colleagues from over there in the design of our studies to figure out where we should uh, suggest placement of these. And the whole process that Rhode Island went through was unique in the in the world in that it was this special area management plan process that was directed in part by um, CRC. The advantage of it was, and the way that we avoided having much of a negative impact on the, by the Block Island wind farm, was that we considered a variety of different natural resources, including the birds that we study. And um, put all that information together and avoided putting the wind farm in places where it might potentially have negative impact. For example, there will be no wind turbines in waters less than 20 meters deep. And that's because that's where the birds concentrate. So the short answer to your question is we avoided that negative impact by going through a very important planning process so that we place these things in locations where it would minimize an impact. Have these policies that have been put in place to ensure turbine placement has minimal effect on birds and bats been effective? Yeah, the best example of how effective it was, was Massachusetts went through the process in a very different way. The developer decided where they wanted to propose to put these. They did an environmental impact statement. They rationalized where they wanted to put it and what the impacts would be. And then they ended up in litigation for 15 plus years and it never went in the water. Whereas the planning process that Rhode Island went through was successful in that the development did occur and was largely done with the support of all the various groups that had some stake in natural resources, but also wind energy development. How do some birds interact with the turbines? Birds generally interact with structures like offshore wind turbines in one of three ways. So there's, there's basically one interaction, which is they don't because they're flying too high or they don't go that far off the coast to directly interact with them. The other is positive, and there has been some work. It's too early to be able to document this in the U.S. because we just have the Block Island wind farm to date. But in Europe, um, they have shown that the, the base of the turbines that's actually in the water acts as an attractive site for a variety of different marine organisms, whether it's mussels, any, any kind of shellfish, it acts as a structure as well as for fish. And so they have shown that there are some species of birds that actually are attracted to those sites and use the additional resources under the water uh, to their benefit. And then the third category, which is the most important probably, is whether it has a negative effect. And the primary negative effect for birds has been displacement. Um, so if you put them in places where they want to be, they are not going to, for the most part, be there. And so you potentially take those areas out from areas that they might normally be in. That's part of the reason why we went um, so carefully through the planning process to try to figure out where the birds wanted to be, what resources were they relying on, and then to the best of our abilities, spatially map those so that we could say, okay, these are the places we should avoid. And to the benefit of the developer of the Block Island Wind Farm, they listened very carefully to that and they, and they avoided 
uh, putting it in those places that, that were the hot spots. Do we know how many birds and bats are killed by wind turbines each year? The numbers for offshore are very, very, very small. Bats are more vulnerable than birds are, but there's very few bats in North America that fly off the coast for any length of time. And as far as I know, there's no documented evidence of that at the Block Island. And so with offshore wind turbines, they actually have these cool infrared uh, monitoring devices that basically look up from the bottom of the, the, the turbine. And so they can pretty well document if anything collides with um, any of the turbines. Does the placement of the turbines affect birds and bats? And if so, are companies able to pinpoint locations where they won't affect birds or bats? So the best way to avoid affecting birds and bats is when they're constructed to put them in places where the birds and bats don't spend a lot of time or don't want to be. So the best way to avoid any kind of negative effects is to be very careful with the placement of the and construction of these. And then if you put them in the in the places where they're not going to be, you minimize that risk. And then they have played around a little bit with putting different colored lights on some of the turbines to avoid attracting birds. So typical white lights can be attractive to birds, especially in foggy conditions. But the main thing is to instruct them in places where the there would be minimal impact at the start. How do these impacts compare with that of onshore turbines? So that's the uh, apples and oranges comparison. There are a lot of documented negative effects of onshore terrestrial wind turbines. Some of that's for the same reasons that we try to avoid in, in uh, offshore. You try not to put them in places where um, the birds and the bats want to be. So one of the common things about offshore and terrestrial is you still want to be very careful in terms of where you put these. And what have we learned from Europe about the impacts of offshore wind farms on birds? We've learned a lot from our colleagues over in Europe, mainly because they were about 15 years ahead of us and were able to compare um, pre and post construction and then subsequent effects um, after construction. So when we were doing the Block Island wind farm uh, assessment, we already knew that the biggest impact that they were finding was displacement of birds from areas that would have been important habitat for them uh, prior to the construction. The other aspect of the European work was that they were way ahead of us in terms of how to monitor. So they were really important um, in helping us design the plane-based surveys, the ship-based surveys. Um, they'd already figured out some of the modeling aspects of how to deal with those data. Um, so they were also, and that's, applicable to wherever you're trying to do surveys. Um, it's It was helpful to have folks who had already tried to, to do that in offshore areas and could demonstrate what the best approach for surveying was. Just to clarify, why is this information relevant to us? Does Europe have a similar bird population as we do here on the East Coast of the United States? So the same general categories of birds, like they have sea ducks, gannets, cormorants. In some cases, they're the same species, but in other cases, they're different species, or at least different populations of the same species. It doesn't matter so much whether they have the same exact species, because they basically have the same ecological niches. So they have divers, those that migrate long distances and encounter areas because they're in migration. The life history of these birds is very similar, um, and their ecological niches are very similar even though the species might not be the same. What are the laws, regulations, and rules that are put in place to protect birds and bats around wind turbines? So the most important one for birds is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It was enacted in the early 1900s, and that basically legislates no uh, significant impact on any bird that is a migratory bird. And almost every single one of the species that we're talking about that might be impacted by these offshore wind energy developments are migratory birds. So any facility like a wind farm or an oil rig for that matter has to demonstrate that they will not have uh, negative impacts on migratory birds. So they have to do surveys like we did and demonstrate what the potential populations are that might be impacted and then make some case for uh, how much of an impact, if at all, there, there would be. 
for bats, there would also be an a Endangered Species Act for birds and bats. Endangered Species Act, uh, so that if there are any of the species that might be impacted um, were on the endangered species list, then a whole different level of rigor in, of, uh, of it, it basically would minimize the amount of, of damage that they could do to those particular kinds of populations. What, if any, concerns do you have with the predicted growth of offshore wind off of the Atlantic coastline? The biggest issue that I'm worried about, it hasn't come to fruition yet here, but it has over in Europe, is something that we call cumulative effect. The construction of one turbine, set of turbines, whether it's five like the Block Island Wind Farm or 200 like they're talking about Martha's Vineyard, as soon as you start adding these places, more and more of these, especially along the Atlantic coast, you're basically putting them in the same areas um, that the same individuals are going to migrate through in many cases. So many of the species that we were worried about go through Rhode Island waters, and but don't spend the winter here. So they continue and they go down the Atlantic coast. Some of them go quite a bit further down into South America. Others stop in the Carolinas for the winter. Others go to Chesapeake Bay. And so if you put up five, 10, 20 different wind farms along that way, you may be impacting the same population of birds. And the more and more you put up, the more cumulative impacts there may be. So one of those wind farms in and of itself might not have an impact on the population because they can move someplace else. But as soon as you put up many, many, many more, all of a sudden the birds have lost many more of those locations where uh, there's habitat that they need. So what we've been advocating for is site-specific kind of assessments like we've been talking about, but then some kind of larger scale um, attention trying to figure out what those cumulative effects might be. What monitoring would you recommend is put into place to better understand the effects of offshore wind farms on birds? So our recommendation is same kind of monitoring that you did pre-construction, do it at a large enough scale so that you and detect larger scale kinds of, of effects and do it long enough so that you can really fully assess whether um, there's uh, a, a, uh, an impact on the, on the bird population.